Hello friends, I'm Amy from A Star Reads and welcome to my October wrap up. It's a little late this month, but last month was really busy and then November is already shaping up to be a pretty crazy month, especially book wise. If you haven't seen my November TVRs, go ahead and check them out. Pretty crazy. I have a lot of books and I feel like I'm barely scratching the surface already. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about what I read in October. I had a really good reading month, I felt, for me, for what I'm capable of reading. Most of them were high rated. I'm wondering if maybe I just rate everything too highly, and that could be the case. But if I like it, I like it. Maybe I just know how to pick them, I don't know. First, I'm gonna tell you about the one book that I did not get to read at all in October, and I'm really bummed I didn't. I really did want to read this book, and I'm going to read it. I just don't know yet when. I did not get to read Relic by Lincoln Child and Douglas Preston. And that was a book for my Fortnite Frights where it had green on the cover, and it was about some murders that were going on in a natural history museum and they weren't necessarily murders happening by humans. I mean, I know it wasn't Jurassic Park, like I don't think it was dinosaurs, but I kind of got that vibe from it. So I will get to read Relic at some point. I own it, so I will read it. I just don't know yet when. Next, let's talk about the books I am currently working on that I started in October and I'm going to or have already finished in November. And that's The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones and The Witching Hour by Anne Rice. I didn't really like the way I finished out talking about those two books in the video, so I'm gonna do a quick little thing here. I have finished The Only Good Indians at this point, but I will talk about it in my November wrap-up because I finished it in November. And The Witching Hour is a 50 hour audiobook, and I still have like 29 hours left to listen to. So, I mean, that's gonna be a slow going story. Working on that one, I don't know if it'll be done in November, but I'm gonna try. So first I wanna talk about one book that I have not yet given a rating to, and I'm probably gonna save this book for a reread at some point and not rate it until I reread it. And I've got at least one other book that I wanna do that with, and I'm kinda of thinking maybe in the future I'll do like a video where I reread the books I had a hard time rating, and then maybe try and rate them. And that is If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. And I actually watched the movie as well, so I, I read the book first and then I watched the movie. It's a very short story, less than 300 pages, and it feels very short to me. I kind of did want more and that was one of the issues I may have had with it. And at the time I read it, I'd been reading a lot of nonfiction and literary fiction books about the struggle of black Americans during the enslavement period and then through Jim Crow and Ford. And those books were so graphic and so vocal, they were so loud and in a good way, but they were so loud in a way that this book was so subtle in its message that I was having a hard time finding it really compelling and I don't know if that's because of when I was reading it or if because I'm just not as crazy about this book as I am some of the other books I've been reading recently. If Bill Street Could Talk has gotten so much hype and praise, it's really well rated. I feel like I need to give it a second chance at some point. But I'll tell you really quickly what that's about. It's about this young couple named Fonny and Tish. Fonny has been arrested because he was convicted of crime that he did not commit. Their love is so beautiful and pure, and Tish becomes pregnant while Fonny's incarcerated. She's 19, he's 22, I think. They're trying to figure out how are they going to survive this and get Fonny out of prison because he's innocent. His family and her family are trying to come together. They're trying to find out why he was convicted of this crime. And it really did speak to the injustice of the criminal justice system and how it has been so oppressive to not just Fonny, but so many black American men. And so it was a very important story and I really understand the importance of it and wanted to enjoy it. It was just so subtle that at the moment I wasn't prepared for that. But I did enjoy the book because I do like James Baldwin's writing style. It's sort of this gritty prose, you know, he's speaking very poetically, but it's got kind of, of a gritty characteristic to it, and I really liked that. Okay, so the first book I'm gonna actually give a rating to, and I have to apologize to Shell and Nathaniel, because this is the book you gave me. <laughs> the Dollhouse Murders by Betty Wren Wright. This was a 2.75 for me, Shell and Nathaniel. You guys sure know how to pick them. <laughs> And if you don't know why I'm making a joke out of this, go ahead and check out my October TBR, you'll understand it at that point. 
So the main character's name is Amy. She's this young girl who's, you know, reaching puberty and frustrated because she's forced to take care of her younger sister, Luann, who is intellectually disabled. And so at one point she runs away to her aunt's house. Her aunt is living in her grandparents' mansion, you know, big Victorian style house, temporarily just to clean it up and try and sell it, I think. And Amy's there because she just needs to get away from her family. She's frustrated by them. And I'm frustrated by her family too, but I'll get back to that. While she's there, she's up in the attic with her aunt and she sees this huge dollhouse, which is the exact replica of the house that they're in. And she is curious and she's she loves dollhouse. She's so excited about it. And her aunt hates the dollhouse. She's angry about it. It was given to her on her 16th birthday and she's like, it's an inappropriate gift for you know teenager. And there's weird anger towards that dollhouse. Strange happenings start beginning with the dollhouse. There's lessons Amy needs to learn. And then the story kind of builds from there. So the issues I have with this, one, it was written in 1983, a very good year. I mean, if you ask me, <laughs> but it was written in 1983 and the terms they use for intellectual disability were inappropriate for today's standards. So reading them and then just the way they handled Luann, I, I didn't appreciate that. And I I really didn't appreciate the family dynamic with Amy and Luann because the mother really wanted Amy to do everything to take care of Luann. And there's one thing to be responsible for your siblings. There's another thing to cause your child to be angry, hateful, and resentful of their sibling because you're forcing them to take care of a child who needs extra attention. There were issues I had with the family dynamics. There were issues I had with the adult characters. I felt like they were incredibly juvenile in the behavior that they had towards each other. This includes the mother and the aunt mostly. I liked the setting. I really liked that the twist at the end was a twist that even as an adult I didn't get. And so, I mean, it wasn't a horrible book. 2.75 is not bad. It's just, I mean, it was a children's horror and it wasn't terrible, but it, it wasn't that good. <laughs> I might recommend it to children, just kind of with the caveat that we don't talk about people who are intellectually disabled in the way that they talked about back then. So make sure you tell your kids that. <laughs> the next book I'm gonna talk about is Ghostland, an American history in haunted places by Colin Dickey. I gave this one three stars. It's all about the haunted history of the United States. And he talks mostly about how a lot of the oral tradition and the storytelling when it comes to ghost stories is incorrect. And he also talks about how these stories about ghosts are usually formed in situations where there are issues in the political climate, the social climate, the racial situation. So it really does have a lot to do with what's going on within the community or the greater world. And if you wanna know more about this book, I talked about it extensively in my October nonfiction recommendation review video. And so go ahead and check that out. I'll link it here and I'll link it down below. Three stars, it wasn't bad. His writing style wasn't my favorite. Next, I'm gonna talk about Taken at Dusk by C.C. Hunter. I'm gonna talk briefly about this. I've been reading C.C. Hunter's Shadowfall series. It's this young adult supernatural series. Every single book I've consistently given it a 3.75. I like it, I just don't like certain things about it. And it continues the same. I think it's just how the writer writes. Definitely not always politically correct in some of the things she does, but I like enough about this series that I'm enjoying it enough that I keep picking it up. It's sort of like book smut for me. There's no actual smut in this because it's a young adult, but it's, it's like one of those things that I'm enjoying picking up in between other heavier books and it's a quick read. And I do like Supernatural, I think. I just like Supernatural. I have fun picking up those kind of books and it's nice to follow these characters along. I've talked about this a little bit before in my other wrap ups, but the series is about this girl named Kylie Galen and her parents are getting divorced and she's going through some struggles. She's in her teens, 16 I think, and she's angry at the world. And she's kind of getting into little bits of trouble here and there. And her mother sends her to the summer camp that's supposed to help students who are going through difficult situations, let's put it that way. And when she gets there, she actually finds out that there's a much deeper meaning to this. This is actually a summer camp for students who have supernatural powers. And she never suspected herself of having supernatural powers until she came to the summer camp. She has a brand of supernatural that's different than everybody else's, so she's really confused and trying to find her way. There's a love triangle, of course, because everybody wants Kylie. There's a werewolf and a half fae who are both madly in love with her. And her two best friends are a vampire and a witch. So it's just cute. It's, it's got flaws. I just keep reading the next part of the series here and there. So the next one I wanna talk about is Lock Every Door by Riley Sager. And I gave this four stars. This was actually my lowest rated Riley Sager book, which is probably a very unpopular opinion because I know that this was actually a lot of people's favorites. It's a thriller mystery about a character named Jules who takes this job that's way too incredible to be true 
in the Bartholomew, which is this old apartment complex where really rich people live there. People she befriends start going missing. There's something going on at this place and she's trying to figure it out. And if you wanna know more about that, I talked a lot about it in my Riley Saker Challenge video where I read all four books. So go ahead and see that if you wanna know more details about what the plot line is. I'll tell you a little bit here about what I feel about it. Jewel stressed me out. There were so many times when I was like, just go to the cops. Just don't go in there. Don't check that. She just had to, and that drove me bonkers. <laughs> I guess because I'm not that person, I'm very cautious. My mom, right on the other hand, she'll just run right out into the thick of it. But no, I'm not like that. So it just, it was like, ah, you're killing me. I can't take it. So there was a lot of stress in this book. What I did like about it is that the twist at the end was very unique. So, I mean, it is a fun story, don't get me wrong. It's just compared to some of the other Riley Sager books, especially reading them back to back, I had certain preferences when it came to reading all the Riley Sager books. The next one I'll tell you about is The Lady from the Black Lagoon, Hollywood Monsters and the Lost Legacy of Millicent Patrick by Mallory O'Meara. I also gave this one four stars. I really enjoyed it. It's in my October nonfiction recommendation review video, so go there if you want more details on it, but I'll give you a brief description. It's about Millicent Patrick, and she's this woman who worked in Hollywood and actually designed the creature from the Creature from the Black Lagoon. She did not get credit for designing it, but she's the person who designed it. Mallory O'Meara, who idolizes Millicent Patrick, wanted to find her story, find her history, find out what happened to her. This was a great book, I really enjoyed it. It was easy to read, it was a quick read. As you'll eventually see from some of my nonfiction loves and what I really enjoy, I like more of a colloquial language to use when it comes to nonfiction books. I'm finding that to be more and more true the more I read nonfiction books. And then my last specifically four star rating was for Beloved by Toni Morrison. I really love this book, it was very heavy. The prose in it was also complicated. I know that a lot of people that read it had a hard time kind of understanding sometimes what Toni Morrison was saying, what some of the characters were saying, and I actually loved it. I really thought it was just such a beautiful writing style. A horrifying book though, really horrifying. It is about the period of enslavement. Setha, this main character, escaped from there, moved to Ohio, and is has been followed by some of the horrible things that happened because of it. She lives with her daughter, Denver, within this house in Ohio where she, she doesn't have guests, she doesn't have company because nobody will go to that house because she's being haunted day and night by this young baby that was her child and her child died. At one point, Paul D, who's this guy that she was enslaved with, comes and reunites with her and he changes everything. He disrupts the atmosphere of the house in a sense. Shortly after Paul D, this girl named Beloved comes and she's like 19 years old. And even though the ghost seems to be gone, weird things continue to happen. It is a very interesting and compelling read. There are many, many trigger warnings and I need to say that here because I don't know if everybody knows that. There's a lot of things in this book that are difficult to read. There's bestiality, there's physical abuse, there's sexual abuse, there's murder. Just be aware of that before you go into it. If you wanna know more about that, I go into a lot of detail about this book on Fortnite Frights week one. So 4.25 stars goes to The Last Time I Lied by Riley Sager. And this is a thriller mystery also. I think all his books are thriller mysteries. It's about these four girls who go to summer camp. One girl, Emma, is the youngest girl and she watches the three other girls disappear. And she's tormented into her adulthood, wondering whatever happened to these girls. She does art as her career, and all her paintings are focused on this disappearance of these three girls. She ends up getting a job back at the campsite, and she wants to discover where they went, what happened, get some closure. I do talk about this more in my Really Sacred Challenge, but I will say that I really love the setting of this book. The summer camp, the camp setting was just phenomenal for me. It's just a setting that I really enjoy reading about. There are so many twists and turns in this book and it just continues, continues, continues. I really enjoy that. It is a slow paced thriller. So if you are looking for something, you know, that's gonna get your heart racing and be really exciting, this isn't that book, but I just really enjoyed a lot of elements to this. The next book I also gave 4.25 stars to is Home Before Dark by Riley Sager. I would think that I maybe liked The Last Time I Lied a little more than Home Before Dark, However, I read Home Before Dark so fast because I couldn't put it down and I had to know what was next. And so, I mean, that really puts it on par for me. This is probably the creepiest of Riley Sager's books because it deals with a haunted house. There is a character named Maggie and her family buys this house, this old, 
giant house for a price that is unrealistic. And when they move in there, horrible things start happening and they leave suddenly. The father writes a nonfiction book that becomes famous and that book affects Maggie's life until she's an adult. She is haunted by the book because it is a part of her that she doesn't remember one and two has affected the way that people treat her. Her father dies, he leaves her the house. She goes there to clean it up and sell it and things start happening and she starts unraveling the mystery behind this house. And there are a lot of twists and turns in this. Well, I will say one thing about Riley Saker, he likes complex thrillers. He likes complex mysteries. He doesn't like to wrap it up in one nice little neat bow. It's the most obvious answer and he kind of confirms it's the most obvious answer and then you're wrong, you know, and he keeps doing that over and over again. So I do like that about his writing style. I did like this book a lot. It was a little slow moving at times, but I still couldn't put it down. All right, so we're getting up to the higher rated books now. I'd like to talk about The Switch, which is a 4.5 star rating for me. It's a book I got from NetGalley by Macmillan Audio, and I really appreciate them allowing me to review this book. And it was an audiobook, so I listened to the whole thing, and I enjoyed the audiobook part of it. I did enjoy that. I There were a couple of parts where the lady who played Lena, her, sometimes she rushed through some of the dialogue a bit fast, and it was hard to catch what she was saying. I loved the voice of the woman who spoke for the older character, Eileen, and she just was my favorite character. I just loved everything about her. It's about these two women named Eileen Cotton and Lena Cotton, their grandmother and granddaughter. Eileen is about to turn 79. She has been left by her ex-husband, who was really a jerk, and she's looking for love, you know? She takes care of her community, she takes care of her neighbors and the people she cares about within the community, but she wants love, she wants to find love, she wants adventure. She never got to have that adventure because she married and had a child really young. Lena is struggling because her younger sister, Clara, died of cancer fairly recently. She's angry at her mother because her mother allowed her sister to say, I'm ready to die and not go forward with any further treatment. And so Lena's still so angry at her mom because she wanted to try everything before her sister died. She's always been amazing at her job and what she does, but she's starting to have nervous breakdowns, like during big important meetings. Her boss puts her on a two month sabbatical. She's a great enough worker that her boss is not gonna let her go, but she says, you know, you need to take time and deal with the things you're dealing with. So she goes to visit her grandma. And at that time, they both kind of hatch this plan where they're gonna switch places. Lena's gonna stay in the small town that her grandma lives in, take over her grandmother's life in a sense, do all the community things, take care of people that need to be taken care of, including her mom, who she has unresolved problems with. And Eileen is gonna go to London and she's going to start online dating. And she's gonna kind of live a life of excitement out in London. It's really a cute and fun romance. It's also very heartwarming. There is so much that has to do with familial relationships and the relationships between these strong women, they're all very strong women and they're just in pain and struggling at the moment. And this situation helps them to heal. This story meant a lot to me because I have always had a very strong relationship with my own mom and then with my grandma. So the three of us had a very close knit relationship and this of course brings to mind all the amazing elements of that strong female relationship that I've had in my life. For a romance novel, it was fantastic. It was really one of the better romance novels I've read, I thought. My issue, however, was speaking of romance, there wasn't enough sexual tension or buildup. I, I needed more romance and it was there in teeny, teeny, tiny little bits, not nearly enough. I wanted way more of that. My last two books are both five-star books. Woo! I wanna preface this by saying that other people probably won't feel these are five-star books, but I do. Something about five-star books, they just feel like five-star books. When you're reading a book, you can tell pretty early on, or at least you can really tell when it's gonna be a five-star book. It's just, you get a feeling about it, right? At least I do. The first one is probably gonna be a very unpopular opinion, but I gave Final Girls by Riley Saker five stars. And the reason that I'm sure it's an unpopular opinion is because I loved this book over his other books. And that is not true for most people. I just loved this book. I liked the characters so much. I loved the twists. I, I just, I liked the setting of it, everything about it just did it for me. Uh, it was exciting, it was thrilling. I enjoyed finding out different things about the characters. These are probably my favorite characters of all the Riley Sager books. 
and I could not put this book down. I didn't want to put it down. I just love the main twist. It's perfect. I don't know. I, it may not have been his best written of the four books, but I didn't care. I just love this one. So what happens in this one, and you can also see my Riley Sager video for this because I do talk about it quite a bit because it was my favorite. Quincy is this girl who goes on this vacation in college with her friends and all her their friends get massacred by this guy and she's the only person who survives and she doesn't remember a thing and the media considers her this final girl because there's been th two other girls like her who survived a massacre different situations for theirs but they're considered the final girls because they're the only ones who survived the first final girl is this woman who wants to take that experience the horror of it all she uses the publicity for being a final girl to try and figure out a way to heal so she doesn't hide from being a final girl and the other two Samantha who's the second final girl and Quincy are trying to kind of brush it all under the rug they don't want to deal with it unfortunately even though the, the first final girl has been so vocal about healing and taking care of herself she commits suicide and Quincy's reeling because she doesn't understand how she could have committed suicide considering she was the one who was really trying to heal from it and was moving on in her life Sam comes seeks out Quincy one, she always seems to be needing money and help, but two, she kind of wants to help Quincy get through this because they're the only two who really can understand what they're going through. You're kind of like, what is Sam doing there? Who is she? What's her deal? She's, she seems kind of weird. She's definitely very strange. Okay, I'm gonna pop in here because I start struggling after this point <laughs> for some reason. What I go on to say is that Quincy is trying to understand the suicide and so she starts doing some research of her own and as she's figuring things out and going through the motions, she starts remembering things about that horrible day. That's kind of when all the twists and turns start coming. And I just loved it. I think the story was amazing and no one's gonna convince me otherwise. <laughs> My second five star book that I wanna talk about, which is the book I finished last in October, was The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. And this was another one where I've read some of the reviews and people see issues with the writing and see issues with certain things and I, I probably can agree that maybe they're there, but I didn't care. I love the setting and the characters. I loved the message. This book was just fantastic for me. I talk a lot about this book in the Fortnite Frights week one and week two episodes because I start reading it during week one and finish it in week two. So if you wanna know more details about it, that'll it'll be there. It's a dark fantasy about this girl named Emmanuel, and she's fairly ostracized in her community because her mother, who was supposed to be one of the wives of the prophet, actually ran off with an outskirter, someone who's not from the community, and she has a child out of wedlock. She has Emmanuel. She had ran away from the community, and she was considered a witch. People thought she was a witch. They thought she was evil. This is a very highly, highly religious community. It was very patriarchal. There were multiple wives. They sacrificed animals. And so what I actually liked about this story was that setting, was the cult light perspective, was the patriarchal setting, was the fact that it was more of a feminist novel than I even expected it to be. And Emmanuel's trying to uncover what happened to her mother while also trying to stay a good citizen of this community because she does love her community. So things happen, witchcraft happens, uh, plagues happen. And I just loved this, take this whole story and make it into an adult novel and I would probably just keel over and die of happiness. <laughs> I liked how they dealt with ethics in this book, the ethics of the community, what the community thought was right and wrong, and how those feelings may have been completely different than what we know or feel to be right and wrong as a reader. Five stars, five stars for that, five stars for Final Girls. And so that's it. Those were my October books. I really enjoyed my month. I read a lot of really dark and scary things this month. And I don't even just mean like slasher horror scary, but like horrifying scary. And that's okay because I added in a few lighthearted things here and there to kind of, you know, even it out a bit. I'm ready for November. I've already started reading for Indigathon and Believeathon, so I'm really excited about this next month. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe now if you want to see more of my feelings on books and how I like them. And if you feel like it, I'd love to have you and I'd love to discuss some books with you. Thanks for watching and I will see you next month.